Good morning, beloved Pastor Jay Williams here. I'm the lead pastor of Union Church Boston. We say welcome uh, and good morning uh, to our uh, wonderful experience of worship on this Sunday. It is our friends and family Sunday. We are uh, delighted that you are here. It's a great day to be alive and what a mighty God we serve indeed. Uh, we want to invite you to do a couple of things. At Union, uh, we are a vibrant and growing faith community. We're gathering digitally and uh, as we gather online, uh, we're a church that says it is good to text in church. Uh, so we invite you to go ahead and put in the chat. If you are here, uh, who's in your uh, home right now so that we have an a accurate estimate of our attendance on uh, this day. We invite you also to use the chat as a, a talk back feature, a talk back to the preacher, which is me today, a talk back to one another and really use it as an interactive a means of being engaged. If it's your first time here at Union on this Friends and Family Sunday, we extend to you a very special welcome. And go ahead, if you might uh, indicate in the chat, if it's your first time here, so that a member of our ministerial team might reach out to you. For all of our worshipers today, you can go to unionboston.org forward slash online and get uh, all of the information, including a bulletin for today's uh, service. You can fill out a connect card uh, so that we might reach out to you and be in touch and uh, be able to celebrate uh, fully with one another. Don't worry though, you don't have to have the bulletin. We're gonna guide you through the service in a way that allows you to participate uh, fully on this friends and family uh, Sunday. At Union, you are family indeed. Today, in specific, uh, we've got a, a number of things that are exciting that are going to happen. We're beginning a new sermon series and a new Bible study series. We're going to be experiencing the Old Testament with newness and learning from the Hebrew scriptures on how we might apply it in our lives today. In addition, we will celebrate today, since it is the first Sunday of the month, we will celebrate our love feast. It is a ritual that is similar to Holy Communion, but since we're not in the building able to celebrate face to face, uh, we are not celebrating Holy Communion, but we are celebrating the ritual of the love feast. We'll say more about that in a moment, but if you don't already have a uh, a bread of choice or a beverage of choice, go ahead and grab that so you might have that ready. You are invited to eat and to fellowship uh, together uh, throughout the service. Want to uh, lift up, because we are family, uh, that one in our family is uh, particularly in a, a tough spot on today. Just got a call from Eric Eversley uh, that his wife, Jean, is uh, in hospice care and uh, likely is transitioning. Uh, so he and the Eversley family ask your prayers and I will uh, be going over to uh, their home uh, following service uh, to extend the love, extend the table and celebrate uh, with them uh, as family. So we lift them and hold them in prayer on this uh, day that is full of so much emotion. And we're gonna lean into it. Uh, but finally, before we sing our opening hymn, Blessed Assurance, uh, today is a great day because we're going to launch our union app, the official union app, uh, and more to come about that. But there is so much going on today. So we're excited. I'm delighted. We welcome you to union and we invite you to sing our opening congregational song, Blessed Assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine. This is my story. This is our song, Praising Our Savior all the day long. Let us sing together.
Amen. This is our story and our song. As we celebrate the love feast, we invite you to hear these words and listen deeply. No matter where you are, no matter who you are, we prepare this table with you in mind. From Brazil to Germany to Canada to the US, from tiny one bedroom apartments to homes in the suburbs, from doctors and lawyers to teachers and dreamers, we prepare this table with you in mind. Whether you're a seasoned theology professor or a skeptical student, whether you're a lifelong Christian or a curious visitor, whether you've got this church thing figured out or you still have a few more bones to pick, we prepare this table with you in mind. We are invited to come with our joys and our struggles. We come with our prayers and our questions and our fears and our hopes. What's most important is that we come. So come, and in doing so, know that this table was prepared with you in mind. This meal is known as the Love Feast. It is an ancient ritual commemorating the many meals that Jesus shared with his followers. This meal is not a sacrament, but it is sacramental. For those of us searching for God in hidden places, it reminds us that the spirit of life is found in ordinary places. So we partake remembering that just like leading a life of love, we do not come to the table alone. And so as we eat, we keep in mind the many stories among us, holding each one of them close for our bland meals are suddenly seasoned through the gift of life here. So you're invited to take your bread and your cup as we give thanks. Following the voice of the leader, you are invited to repeat a simple response. Grant us, holy God, abundant life. Grant us, holy God, abundant life. How wonderful it is and pleasant for God's people to live together in harmony. We say welcome to this meal in the name of Christ. We're here to share in God's love. We come to share our food, our lives. We come to see each other, to bear witness to one another. We come to break this bread while mending our hearts. And so let us all say together, grant us, grant us holy God, God abundant, abundant life. You are the one who leads, guides us, moves us forward. We listen for your voice, the voice that speaks amidst all the static and the noise in order to say, I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. And the people say, grant us, grant us holy God, holy God abundant life. As we share our food this morning, we give thanks for abundance. And we pause to remember all those who do not have enough on this day. May you, O oh Holy God, give food to those who are hungry. May God give us a hunger and a thirsting for justice and a determination to minister to those who hunger for food. And the people say, grant us, holy God, holy God abundant, abundant life. So we pray. O oh God, who cares for us so much that you bless us with one another. For your unfailing love, we give thanks. For sustenance. Sustenance for all your children, we pray. Through this shared meal, strengthen us so that we can love one another. 
listen to one another, encourage one another, help one another, forgive one another, fight for one another, and in doing so, know again and again your amazing grace and abundant love. And the people say, grant us, grant us. Holy, holy God. God abundant life. life. So in the living love of God and with the people of God that we love, let us share in the love feast together. You are, you are invited to eat and partake in this great gift of love. So you might eat throughout the service as we gather around a table together. But all God's people say, amen. Mr. Ashley. I'll be reading from the book of Ezra this morning. Ezra chapter 3, verses 8 to 13. In the second year, after their arrival at Jerusalem in the second month, Zerubbabel, son of Shatyal, and Joshua, son of Josadak, made a beginning together with the rest of their people, the priests and the Levites, and all who had come to Jerusalem from the captivity. They appointed the Levites from 20 years old and upward to have the oversight of the work on the house of the Lord. And Joshua with his sons and his kin, and Hamael and his sons, Benu and Hodaviah, along with the sons of Hinnadad, the Levites, their sons and kin, together took charge of the workers in the house of God. When the builders laid the foundation of the temple of the Lord, the priests in their vestments were stationed to praise the Lord with trumpets and Levites, the sons of Asaph, with cymbals, according to the direction of King David of Israel. And he sang responsibly, praising and giving thanks to the Lord, for God is good, and God's steadfast love endures forever towards Israel. And all the people responded with a great shout when they praised the Lord because the foundation of the house of the Lord was laid. But many of the priests and Levites and heads of families who had seen the first house on its foundations wept with a loud voice when they saw this house. So many shouted aloud for joy so that the people could not distinguish the sound of the joyful shout from the sound of the people's weeping. But the people shouted so loudly that the sound was heard far away. The word for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen.
It's who you are and I'm loved by you It's who I am It's who I am It's who I am Let the people of God say amen. Let us pray. Oh God, speak now, we listen, because you are so very good. And may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be found acceptable, oh God, our rock and our redeemer. It's in the precious and matchless name of Jesus Christ that we pray. Let all God's people say amen. Beloved, today I want to preach about faith. Not the faith of our fathers, because it was my great grandmother, Granny, who nurtured mine. Today I want to preach about faith. But it's not the kind of faith that you get from merely doing what your parents and the faith did. You see, I'm not talking about something learned from mimicking what you've seen someone else do not talking about some rites and rituals that you recite because you've learned them as a child. No, I'm not talking about something that you heard or read in a book. Today, I want to preach about faith, the kind of faith that you've got to get for yourself. Because even though my mother prays for me and she has me on her mind and I'm so glad that she prays, the longer I live, the more I've come to realize that the faith of my mother or the faith of my father won't save me, won't rescue me from the attacks, won't lift me up when I'm despairing, won't pluck me out of the sleepless nights, won't keep my head up when I want to drop it, won't pick me up when I fall, won't save me from myself because late in the midnight hour when you have to cry yourself to sleep, you can't simply rely on what somebody else has told you or taught you. There's some things that you've just got to learn for yourself. Today, I wanna preach about faith. Look and hear me clearly, I'm not talking about a faith that comes from outside of you. It's more like something that bubbles up inside. Yes, you've got to have something inside of you that grounds you and connects you to the power of God that dwells within you. Because God's image is written upon every cell of your body. Every molecule in your flesh reflects the beauty of God. Every atom is charged with a spark of divinity and every strand of DNA is a carbon copy of the cosmic soul force and spiritual matter of the good, good mother God, out of whose womb the creation was birthed. And that goodness is the foundation of our faith, a faith that will keep you. Yes, beloved, there is something inside of you that is part of you that is more than you, and it's the spirit of the living God working within you. It, it, it's a faith that, that, that transcends the book because God doesn't live in the book. The spirit of the living God lives inside of us. And when the living word of God is written upon the tablets of your heart, you can face any death-dealing ways of a world that seeks to destroy you. That's the faith I'm talking about today. The got-to-know-God-for-oneself kind of faith. And you see, it's out of that sense of one's own self that one sees one place in the universe. And one becomes a, a, a person, 
I heard a, a preacher once say, and I quote, she told them that the only grace that they could have was the grace that they could imagine, that if they could not see it for themselves, then they would not have it. Yes, I'm talking about that faith, that, that faith that tells you to love you and to love your flesh. I'm talking about the faith that helps you to weather the storm because when the storms of life are raging, that's the kind of faith I need, the kind of faith that grounds you and keeps you and keeps you keeping on along the way. Yes, that kind of faith when you've lost your way, when you're tired of walking along the way and folks keep throwing roadblocks in your way, the kind of faith that keeps you plugged into the way, the truth and the life when it looks like there is no way, the kind of faith where God makes a way out of no way, it's the faith that allows you to find yourself when the world around you is losing its mind and is falling apart and you find yourself thrust into the chaos and confusion and it feels like you're losing your way and you're losing your mind and you're losing your sense of direction. Right here, amidst the chaos and confusion, this is where we find ourselves. And I submit to you today that that's where we are unclear whether schools will or should reopen, unsure where the rent money for next month is going to come from because of partisan politics that sacrifice people on altars of greed and fiscal policy, unsure and uncertain whether you're safe in your own home because no-knock warrants helped bad cops kill Breonna Taylor who still remain at large. Here we are, dazed and confused, angry and frustrated, uncertain, unsure, and unclear. But beloved, here's the good news. In the midst of chaos and confusion, there is community. In the midst of chaos and confusion, there is community. That is the simple and core message for today. That we are all in this together. And it's from being together on this Friends and Family Sunday, from being together, that we find ourselves and our strength. This is the message we glean from Ezra, the third chapter, as we begin our August sermon series on experiencing the New Testament, the Old Testament with newness, experiencing the Old Testament with newness. It is today's reading, which we heard beautifully read by Reverend Ashley. It's today's reading. Uh, that grounds us. It's actually one of my favorite passages in the Old Testament and the entirety of the Bible and all of Scripture. It, it's so good, and, and, and there's a word in, in it. Uh, uh, but before we go too far into Ezra itself, someone may be asking, why start a study of the Old Testament? Uh, why start it with, to begin it with, Ezra? Right, because Ezra, the priest, the scribe, is not famous like Noah and his ark, or Abraham and his blessing, or Moses and his exodus, or Esther and her for such a time as this. Shouldn't we begin uh, with David or Solomon or Jacob or Isaac or, or Deborah, someone who is a, a little bit more well-known? Well, I, I posit for you, we, we start with Ezra, who is, is not so famous or familiar or prominent or powerful because that's where God begins. God is the God of the oppressed and the, the downtrodden and the God who pulls from the margins all of us who have ever felt left out or excluded from the in crowd. God takes that which was placed on the outside, that which was rejected and discarded and disposed of. God takes that and, 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 and takes it and takes you, takes me and places us right at the center of the grand story. 
Yes, beloved, God lives within the choices that we make and God chooses to act differently. Not in the standard, normative, linear way of telling the same old tired story. God tells a different story. God pens a new narrative and, and God, God writes this story upon the tablets of our hearts and, and we are the main characters. We who desire, who, who, who yearn for a more excellent way. So we begin. We begin our August sermon series with Ezra. And, and not with a more predictable start with, say, Adam and Eve or Abraham. We start with Ezra because it is important for us to tell the not so often, not so spoken story. It's important for us to tread the road less traveled. And through Ezra, who writes of events, at the end of the Old Testament. Today we might begin again. Always beginning again. Educator and leadership guru and his seven habits of highly effective people, Stephen Covey once said that we are to begin with the end in mind. We begin with the end in mind. So that's what we're doing here. You see, beloved, today's passage from Ezra chapter three is situated historically at the end of the Old Testament. At an extraordinarily important time in the life of the people of Israel. It was at the end the death of the nation of Israel as they knew it. So our story for today, it picks up right after the devastation of Jerusalem, the city of God and the destruction of the Holy Temple that was at the center of Jerusalem. The story picks up after the devastation of Jerusalem and the destruction of the temple and when the Israelites, the Jews were exiled into captivity into Babylon. It's where the story picks up. If the, the crucifixion and resurrection of Jesus is for us the central turning point for Christians, then we might say that the destruction of the temple is the central turning point for the Israelites. But where there's crucifixion, there is resurrection. Where there is destruction, there is renewal and there is new life. So this is where Ezra uh, picks up. He writes about what happens at the end of the Old Testament when the people come back from exile. Ezra, the scribe, the priest, tells us that the exiled and then freed people return to Jerusalem. They return to Jerusalem, the city of God, and they start rebuilding. They start rebuilding and restoring what was lost and fixing what was broken to lay the foundation of the temple that was destroyed. Ezra picks up here, rebuilding, restoring, fixing what was broken, laying the foundation of the temple that was destroyed. And as that's happening, the scriptures tell us there is enormous chaos and confusion, not unlike the chaos and confusion that we find ourselves in today. Enormous chaos and confusion, and we hear these words from Ezra chapter three, beginning in verse 11, and all the people responded with a great shout when they praised the Lord because the foundation of the temple of the Lord was laid. But many of the priests and the Levites and the heads of families who had seen the first temple on its foundations, they wept aloud when they saw the temple, though many shouted for joy, so that the people could not distinguish the sound of joyful shout from the sound of the people's 
weeping. The people shouted so loudly with joy and with tears that the sound was heard very far away. So there's tension, right? The same tension that we feel in our bodies, in our bones. Like the people of Israel, sometimes it is hard to tell the difference. Difficult to find the balance amidst this conflict of sadness and joy. Yes, beloved, we live in an age of abnormal ambiguity. On the one hand, we live during a time of unprecedented pain and a time, on the other hand, of unprecedented possibility. We find ourselves in this age of ambiguity. We find ourselves betwixt and between. On the one hand, the, the time of slowing down has afforded us the opportunity to just be to do things that we otherwise would not do, to, to garden, to go on walks, to have long lingering conversations with the people we love. This week I had a reunion with my college roommates, five of us just able to sit and be and to laugh and to share, which we hadn't all done, the five of us, uh, since we were college roommates 20 years ago. At Union, Zoom Church, right, uh, has allowed for our Union family to be reconnected despite where we are living physically from, from Boston to Brazil, from Germany to Grand Rapids. The difficulty of the pandemic and our inability to worship in building has allowed us to reconnect to expand our family as families, biological families, have been able to worship together and join together again. The tension, the chaos is present and the struggle is real. Struggle is real. I wonder whether the message of this passage invites us to lean into the power that comes from our community, right? It says in the second year after their arrival at the house of God at Jerusalem in the second month, Zerubbabel, son of Sheathiel and Jeshua, son of Jezodak, they made a beginning together with the rest of their people the priests and the Levites and all who had come to Jerusalem from captivity. Right, right, maybe that's the key to dealing with the very real struggle, the very real tension, for dealing with the holy contradiction that there are both shouts of joy and cries of sadness. Uh, maybe that's the key that they might, that we might make a beginning together as community, right? What if the struggle, which is real, is not to be resisted? Because Frederick Douglass is correct, there is no progress without struggle. What if the, the struggle is not to be resisted? What if it is to be held and embraced in community as friends and family? Because we don't do this alone. We just make a beginning together, even when the starting place is imperfect. Right? Like the people of Israel, you don't need to have everything uh, built before you start praising. What you just need is a solid and firm foundation. You don't need to know the end. You just have to make a beginning. You just have to lay the foundation. Yes, while we begin with the end in mind, we don't need to know how to get there. Rather, we just simply set out. 
We begin with the end in mind, but we don't need to know how to get there. We, we just set out and we face the chaos and the confusion. We face it in community. And it is with each other that we might find ourselves and, and the strength that we need, you see, beloved. The story of Israel, the Old Testament, is one of a people of faith. It's a story of holy resilience, of a people who would just not give up, no matter what devastation and pain they endured. It's a story of a people who would not back down, but it is also a story of a people who remained together as family, as community, even when they were exhausted, uh, even though the, the, the song had not been penned yet. I, I'm sure they sang that spiritual, I don't feel no ways tired. Uh, I've come too far from where I started from. Nobody told me that the road would be easy, but I, I don't believe God's brought me this far to leave me. We are a community with a God who just won't leave us, who just won't let us go, and who provides for us a community of faith, that it gives us a holy resilience, that grants us the capacity to thrive even in the midst of trouble and trauma because resilience is the strength to carry on because God carries us and all that we are carrying. God bears our burdens and all the burdens that, that seek to hold us down. You see, Ezra helps us to see that, that when you are weeping, when you are the weeping ones, you can look to the joyful ones in your community. And you might remember then that trouble don't last always even the good trouble. Ezra helps us to see that when we are joyful, we might remain connected to those who struggle and weep. Because being connected with those who struggle and weep, even when we are joyful, it cultivates empathy and it keeps us honest and keeps us compassionate because while joy comes in the morning, the night of weeping always returns. Oh yes, beloved, community helps us to keep the faith. And the faith community is that firm foundation that we need in order to build a future. The faith community is the firm foundation that we need in order to build a future. It's been said that we, we don't have to have a, a shared vision of the future. We only need a vision of a shared future, a future together. In other words, we don't all have to think alike or look alike or, or have the same upbringings and experience. We only have to say, let's do this together because we are stronger together. We, we just need to set out together as a faith community that, that keeps the faith when so much around us is unfaithful and unreliable and untrustworthy. So much around us is uncertain and unsure. We just need to set out as a faith community together. So you may be asking, what if I don't have faith? Well, I'm reminded of John Wesley, the founder of our Methodist movement, who asked a really important question, how can you preach faith to others if you don't have faith yourself? John asked one of his mentors, Peter, if he should stop preaching. Uh, catch this, right? Right. John Wesley was actually, when he asked this question to his mentor, he, he was already ordained at this point. And he was always a preacher, ordained, uh, but, but he asked, what if, how do I preach it when I don't have the faith myself? When I, when I feel like giving up, when, I, when I'm, I'm tossed to and fro, when I'm caught up in this tension and, 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 and I'm losing my faith. Uh, and he had not at this point had the assurance of his own salvation. Uh, he hadn't had his famous Aldersgate experience where his heart was strangely warm and he, he received that blessed assurance that Norris sang about. But his mentor, 
uh, uh, replied to him when he asked, should I stop preaching? He's, his mentor, Peter, said, by no means. Then John asked, what do I preach? What can I preach? And his mentor answered, preach faith till you have it. And then because you have it, preach faith all the more. Preach faith till you have it. And then because you have it, preach faith all the more. Right? One does not need to be perfect. One only has to be willing to set out. One doesn't have to have it all built up, have it all together. One only has to make a beginning, a start, to take the leap of faith, or perhaps better said, a leap to faith. Because faith is an orientation, the evidence of things hoped for. Faith is a posture, a position of possibility. Scripture says, when the builders laid the foundation of the temple of the Lord, the priests and their vestments were stationed, were positioned to praise the Lord with trumpets and cymbals, and they sang, praising and giving thanks to the Lord, for God is good and God's steadfast love endures forever toward Israel. Like the remnant of Israel that returned to Jerusalem from Babylon, sometimes you've just got to be in the position, in the posture of faith. You've got to get into the position to praise and, and just declare that God is good and God's mercy endureth forever. And when we adopt a, a, a posture of praise, a, a posture of possibility, we, the remnant, amidst all the hard work, might declare that God is still worthy. When we have that orientation, that posture of possibility, uh, we might be able to declare, even in the midst of ambiguity, that all things will work out for good. You see, faith had often been reduced uh, to a mere set of doctrines, of dogmas and disciplines, right? It, it reduced from this posture, this position of possibility. Uh, it, it's, it's rooted in this Euro modernity that depends on a disciplining of our difference, right? And a, a full rationality that relies on binaries that force us between these ambiguities to choose either or. But perhaps the Israelites could not distinguish between the shouts of joy and the sound of weeping because they were not supposed to. Maybe we're not supposed to have everything figured out. Maybe we're just called to be together in faith as a faith community wherever we are, in joy and in sadness, in sorrow and in gladness. It's a faith community because faith is so much greater than a set of beliefs. Faith is so much more than an either or choice. It's greater than this doctrine or that doctrine. Faith is the blessed assurance that we have each other amidst anxiety causing ambiguity, a blessed assurance that resists apathy and ambivalence and says, here we are, still here, together. I'll be honest with you, beloved. I don't always believe everything I learned in Sunday school or in seminary. And every doctrine of the Christian faith does not make rational sense. I don't always have the answers of life that I desire. And still, I know that God is real and God is good. A God who cannot be contained by the complications of Christian 
community, a, a God who holds the tension and holds us in this uncomfortable tension and comforts us in the midst of our complicatedness. A God who knows this is more than a journey of the head. Our faith is about something in our hearts. So I know in my heart, when I don't always know in my head, I know in my heart that God desires for me to live the abundant life. And I know that God wants me to flourish. And I know that God promised me a future with hope and, and to prosper me and never to harm me. And I know that while we are never called to check our brains at the doors or at the computer screen, as it were, I know that, that at the end of the day, I need more than knowing something in my head. I want to know it in my heart. And I want to feel the power of the Holy Spirit enlivening me. And here's one thing I did learn in the book. From 20th century, from 18th century theologian Friedrich Schleiermacher, who defined religion as that feeling of absolute dependence. That faith is a feeling that transcends everything around us, that transcends doctrines and dogmas and this and that, this belief for that belief. Faith is something that speaks through the ambiguity. It speaks to our heart. Nehemiah Angelou is right. I've learned that people will forget what you said and what you did. People will never forget how you made them feel. And like that unnamed saint, civil rights movement, I don't want a God I can't feel sometimes can't feel in my heart. So that's what this is all about, this journey at Union. Amidst chaos and confusion, we're called to cultivate community. Because what's most important is at, that we're in this together. So like the people of Israel, beloved people of Union, let us begin, let us make a beginning. Let us proclaim the goodness of God, and the one who inhabits the praise of God's people, the one who is faithful in all things from foundation to forever, that God will be with us. Don't have to have all the answers. We only have to make a beginning in faith don't have to know the end. We only need to make a beginning. Thanks be to God. Amen.
Amen. If you feel something in your heart uh, that maybe was only in your head before, uh, say amen. <laughs> if you know that God is real and, and the spirit is moving, say amen. Uh, beloved, my name is uh, Pastor Nikki Young. I'm the assistant pastor here at Union, and uh, I want to be one to invite you into membership into this community. This is something we do every week, because even though we're not in a building right now, the doors of this church are always open to every person, no matter who you are. What I love so much about these musicians that we get to witness and be blessed by every week is that they remind us that maybe you can't hit all of the notes right now. Maybe you don't know all the words to every song, but the reason why we do the life of faith in community is that someone will hit that note for you. You'll have a community to carry you along as you dance uh, this life together. So no, here at Union, uh, we invite you to go to unionboston.org slash on online to click become a member and then to uh, reach out to uh, one of the pastors either myself or pastor jay so that we might strike up a conversation we are here to support you 
I know we say this church is so great and perhaps we're a little biased because we get to preach and pray over it all the time, but uh, we'd like to invite you now to hear from some of Union's own members about the ways in which this church has blessed them and carried them forward. So I'll invite uh, Cyrus to go ahead and play our testimonial video for you all. Hi Union, I'm Justin J. Pearson, and I am a part of the Chronicles of Narnia book study, as well as the Friday Meditation, and I'm asking that you might join us. Hi, my name is Michaela, and I'm in the Union Reads book study, and um, I participated in the Acts Bible study and the Romans Bible study. Hello, I'm Tanya Barlow. I joined Wednesday night Bible study at 6 p.m. because I wanted to learn more about the scriptures and how to apply it in today's uh, society, in today's world. The Chronicles of Narnia book study is an amazing opportunity to look at literature, but it's really about building community through conversations about the book, but also what's going on in our world. The thing I love most about the Bible study is I'm seeing the text in a new way and thinking about different elements that I previously have overlooked. Um, and my favorite thing about the Union Reads book study is that I'm hearing so many different perspectives from so many other people. And as a young person, it's really valuable to me to hear from older people in the community um, and their perspectives on life and even just their reflections on the book. I hope you all would join us on Wednesday at 6 p.m. I love the teachings of Pastor Jay, Pastor Nikki, and Minister Cal. And then all those who have been participating we break out into small groups and come back together and discuss the scriptures. I really appreciate and value the Friday meditation because it reminds us that there is a God that is bigger than this moment and we have a responsibility to connect intentionally with that God and with one another. I've really enjoyed my time in both of these studies. Um, if you're interested, I would highly recommend them both. So join us at 6 p.m. Looking forward to seeing you. Thank you. So I hope on Fridays at noon you might join the Friday Meditation and every other Sunday you might join the Chronicles of Narnia Book Study as we seek to continue to be church virtually. God bless you. Good morning, Union. My name is Angela Nelson. And I am excited to say it's time for the offering. And although we cannot pass the plate, we can still give. And giving is an act of worship. We realize that these are hard times for everyone. And as you are able, you can support our ongoing ministry during these difficult times by going to unionboston.org slash give or text to give. Just text the dollar amount to 84321 and follow the instructions. Thank you in advance. Yes, Union, it's time for the offering. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. I just want to thank you, Lord.
Indeed, we thank God, the Lord who loves us, who loves us into freedom. And we are so glad about our opportunity to be in worship on uh, today. Uh, we invite you as we come to the close of the service to leave this place with never God's presence to receive a couple of wonderful uh, announcements that we are so very excited about. I want to turn it over right now uh, for our first and most important announcement. Uh, I want to turn it over to my partner, Robert, uh, for uh, our special release. Good afternoon, Union. My name is Robert Kelsey, and I'm a co-contributor on Union's Tech Arts team. Um, back in early April, along with Minister Kyle Walden, Cyrus Weaver, and James Ross, um, the tech team uh, began a process of dreaming, envisioning how we might really help our congregation stay connected um, to one of our most valuable resources, which is each other. And so we set out down a road and put in countless hours of meetings with developers, sending each other Slack messages back and forth, building and testing, and yes, praying. And now, of all of that chaos, we are praising God because we have the Union Church Boston app. So without further delay, let's check it out. Welcome to the Union Church app. My name is Kyle, the Minister for Digital Union and Community Engagement, and I am so excited to introduce Union's official app. The purpose of our mobile app is to get Union's spiritual resources into your pocket while bringing us all closer together to be the church online. So let's check it out. Notice that the app opens on the Home tab. The best way to stay up to date with everything happening at Union is by turning on your push notifications. And don't worry, we won't overwhelm you with notifications. When you first get the app, you'll receive a prompt to turn them on. But you can also turn them on by going up here to the top left with the three lines. Go to Settings, Notifications, On. Notice here that you can also toggle Sunday service notifications. This is how we'll send you the worship bulletin in each week. Back to our home screen, you will find the best features for Sunday morning worship, like the button to go straight to Zoom from your device. Here, you can also find our convenient Give button. Just press Continue, and it will take you to our website to make your digital contribution there. When worship is over and the week begins, you can now come here to the app to listen to any of the preaching team sermons or the music ministry's music. Under the Sermons tab, you will find everything organized by sermon series, or you can see all available sermons listed by date under All Sermons. In the Music tab, you can find most of Union's music since March. You'll find our music videos from worship under Videos, while the hymns can be found under Audio. Here, one of the app's most exciting features is that not only is all of Union Media available in one place, you can easily download anything to take it wherever you go. Next, you can go to the More tab to find other great features that will keep you connected to God and to what's going on at Union. And Connection takes us to our last tab, Connect. Here, you will find all of our connection groups in one location. You can go to group pages to sign up, or you can easily jump over to Zoom for our Wednesday prayer call or Friday meditation. Finally, we have the feature that we are most excited about. In the top right corner, when you click the two speech bubbles, you will go to messaging. This is like texting, but within the app and within our church community. Now, we are no longer separated by social media. Messaging is a really great way to stay in touch, make prayer requests, and meet others at Union. And it's also very safe and secure. In fact, for now, the only way you can be a part of the messaging group is if an admin allows you in. So there you have it. We've got an app. This is the initial stage of our mobile app, so there is plenty more to come as we live into the app and get more deeply connected through it. So beloved, go ahead and download the app because the doors of our online church are open. Come on in and make yourselves at home. Look here, y'all. Okay. We said that 2020 was going to be the year of elevation and indeed uh, God is taking us higher. Uh, this app 
is absolutely amazing. Uh, so you can just go to both the app stores, either an Apple or Android and download it today. Uh, do it now, <laughs> like hurry up because I just can't contain myself. Uh, you can uh, just download it, uh, Union Church Boston, search for that and it's available. All of the music, uh, will be uh from today's service will be uploaded uh later on tonight first thing in the morning uh but all of the music from our past weeks uh videos audios are already there uh sermons a wonderful tool uh spread it share the news with uh, friends and family as we continue to grow indeed the doors of our virtual church are open uh, and there is a place at the table uh, for you so much gratitude uh, to Robert for his vision to get the app, uh, Minister Kyle for his fortitude in executing and bringing it into fruition along with Cyrus and, uh, and James and other members of our tech team. I'm seeing gratitude being expressed in uh, the chat. Yeah, definitely put your hands together, give our tech team uh, some love. Uh, it, it's really a, a great tool Literally, you can download the music and just listen to it uh, like uh, any other song, MP3, watch the video on the go, uh, share it with uh, friends and family. Uh, so thank you, thank you, uh, thank you. A couple more announcements. So we have begun at, uh, our August sermon series uh, on experiencing the Old Testament with newness. We're going to continue to lean into this uh, posture for a, a, a few months, actually. Uh, we're going to walk through the the Torah, the five books of the uh, the first five books of the Old Testament. Then we're going to move into the history and into the writings and into the prophets before turning to the Gospels and the New Testament. We've been blessed by our Bible study and our sermon series, so we decided to uh, just uh, stay here for a while to tarry a little bit as we, uh, in Bible 101, the last month in July, we were thinking about how to in interpret the Bible. Uh, now we're gonna lean more deeply into content, into specifics, as we increase our, our knowledge, uh, not for the sake of our head, but that uh, we might uh, more fully invite uh, the spirit of the living God into our hearts. So join us. You do need to sign up for Bible study so go to unionboston.org forward slash online uh, to sign up, uh, to sign up. And we will be together on this Wednesday at 6 p.m. All are welcome. No previous uh, prior knowledge necessary. Uh, just come and participate. Uh, join us on, um, join us. Yes, I'm seeing Michaela, you asked, can you sign up in the app? Absolutely. You can do everything uh, through our app. You can join our our Sunday service directly from the app. You can sign up for Bible studies. Uh, you can uh, message with one another, everything. This is a, a portal for connection. Uh, so you can go and log on uh, to our Wednesday morning prayer at 7 a.m. directly from our app, as well as our Friday spiritual refresh, our meditation, uh, our weekly spiritual refreshes, Wednesday prayer call at seven, Friday meditation at noon. You can log in right from the app. Don't forget to turn on notifications to get the, the reminders uh, that when the bulletin comes out, when the new music is uploaded and uh, the prayer call and the like. Also to get in your inbox, the e-newsletter, do join us, uh, unionboston.org forward slash e-news. Sign up there. You can sign up from the app as well. Uh, indeed, God is doing uh, something wonderful and awesome. Only God can get the glory. We are grateful and thankful for everything that God has done, uh, that God will do, that, uh, that we will continue during this year of elevation to go higher, uh, to uh, dig deeper, and to be community indeed uh, together. Before we sing the threefold amen and um, depart uh, for our coffee hour, we want to in indeed say again, 
Uh, welcome to all of our first time worshipers. Uh, we're so glad that you were with us uh, for this exciting Sunday. Uh, you indeed at Union, you are part of our family. So we hope to see you again. Uh, we are grateful for this uh, church family, the ways in which we continue to grow and to uh, reach out to one another. So receive this benediction, beloved. Sometimes life can be chaotic and confusing. But here's the firm foundation for our faith. Just make a beginning. You don't have to have it all together. Just make a beginning and set out on the way together. And now to the God who is eternal from foundation to forever, be all glory and honor and authority henceforth now and forevermore. Let the people of God sing, amen. Amen, beloved. Happy Sunday. Cyrus, you can go ahead and unmute the lines. We can say farewell to another, one another. And those who would like to stick around for virtual coffee hour, uh, you are welcome. Go in peace. Have a great week. Thank you.